This episode is presented to you by NFL Sunday Ticket, now on YouTube and YouTube TV. With NFL Sunday Ticket on YouTube and YouTube TV, you can watch your favorite teams out of market Sunday games, plus watch up to four games at once with multiview. Don't miss the race to the playoffs. NFL Sunday Ticket is now just $39 when bundled with YouTube TV, where you get even more football. Visit youtube.com slash Spotify offer to sign up now. Lowest price on YouTube TV with base plan. Rest of 2023 season. Terms and embargoes apply. No cancellations. This episode is brought to you by Google Pixel, the official fan phone of the NBA and WNBA. The new Pixel 8 and Pixel 8 Pro are built different. How? Take the audio magic eraser tool that helps block out distracting crowd noise so your play-by-play commentary sounds crystal clear. The only phone engineered by Google brings out the audio you care about so your videos sound as crisp as they look. Learn more at googlestore.com forward slash pixel NBA. Audio magic eraser requires Google Photos app. May not work on all audio elements. This episode is brought to you by Columbia Sportswear. It's snowing again, and that wind chill is killer. But you're not worried about that because you shop the Omni Heat Infinity Collection. It's warmth perfected with tiny gold dots that reflect your body heat inside and protect you from the cold outside. No snow or chilly temps can stop you now. Go out anyway. Shop the Omni Heat Infinity Collection now at Columbia.com slash infinity. Apple Card is the credit card created by Apple. You earn 3% daily cash back up front when you use it to buy a new iPhone 15, AirPods, or any products at Apple. And you can automatically grow your daily cash at 4.15% annual percentage yield when you open a high-yield savings account. Apply for Apple Card in the Wallet app on iPhone. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings is available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility. Savings accounts by Goldman Sachs Bank USA. Member FDIC. Terms apply. I feel like in editing, we might be taking out all the weird talk about who's writing the recap. <laughs> no, I, I will probably leave that. I think people like that. Kind of stuff. All right. They can see a little behind the curtain. Here are the sausage being made. We need the... Oh, my God. Anything to shake this So many emotions, so many feelings. David has got his whiskey out. That is, well, Thad hasn't changed at all. Thad, that is just pretty even killed. He doesn't get excited, he doesn't get tingly, he doesn't get sad. But so many oh, emotions. It wasn't tingly for a reason, man. We need to find people to blame. We're going to point fingers. There's analysis that needs to be done. But, you know, we're all fans here. I want to just give everyone a chance to just be sad. Can we just be sad for a second before we start yelling and fighting and screaming fire of Vermees? It's just rough. It was just, just everyone just take a moment. Let let David take a drink and wipe his tears over there. And we let, we can even let let the let the audience listen in here. Just get out anything you need, some guttural yells, some cries, anything you need. Just everyone just take a moment and let it out. You should have told me and my girlfriend that before we got in an argument after the game. <laughs> oh, I was avoiding talking to many people. <laughs> Why was she was she pro fire Vermees and you anti? No, oh, I was like, I need time to be sad and to mourn, and she was nitpicking. I was like, this is not the time to nitpick. <laughs> yeah, there's there just seems to be a sense in this sporting KC nation fan group where it, everyone wants to be a pundit or a, or they want to assess the team like they're the boss or the coach instead of looking at this as like like we're fans and sometimes sometimes the team just didn't have it one day can i go that route can i corner that that take here sometimes <laughs> the team just didn't have it one day and see out or uh, the rsl is a team of destiny right now and you know it just didn't work out can we just can I just say the world's against us? It was all against us, and it just didn't work out. <laughs> if that's helped you sleep at night, yes, go for it. <laughs> okay, I think that does. I think it helps me. <laughs> the world needs villains, and right now they are the villain. Who's the villain? Sporting? No, RSL. They, they're always the villain. I don't, I don't know that that's true. I think David Cho is a villain, but... Always. I think that... The league, I think neutrals are getting behind 
Salt Lake. They're the plucky seven seed. What if they take down the you know record setting New England Revolution? Team of Destiny. Hate them. Hate every second of every moment of their being. Yeah, did I just I think I just immediately shifted to rooting for New England somehow. I think I'm on team New England. I'm to anybody not RSL at this point. <laughs> Portland, New England, Philadelphia. Would have been well, Nashville. Apologies if my uh, my voice is a little raspy today. I was in the cauldron yesterday. It was a long day. There was a lot of drinking and yelling and crying. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing my and crying. I tried to not get to that one, but yes, <laughs> crying was in there as well. I'm doing my best today, but yeah, the voice is a is a wee bit raspy. David, you were in the cauldron as well. How did you take in the game? How was your group over there? Uh, pretty happy to start. <clears throat> I think that early PK gave kind of a false sense of security. Um, but it was not so great, you know, really coming out of the half when I think everybody started to realize like how much RSL was dominating the game. And, you know, after the, after they leveled the game, I think there was a sense of inevitability in our section that we were toast. I might have, it might've been the beers. It might've been, you know, a combination of many things, but I was not savvy to how bad we were getting beaten until I re until I watched highlights and saw, you know, more, more of that game afterwards. But I think that's just, yeah, the, the Calder and I never watch a game very well analytically. And while it did seem like a lot of the action was on the wrong end of the field in that second half, I, yeah, I was not picking up on, on how badly we were getting beaten because they, they, because RSL was winning that game. They they were the better team in the second half, as Vermees openly stated. Yeah, second half was definitely RSL. First half was pretty even or our pro sporting or in sporting's favor, but that second half, man, they just came out dead. How is that possible? How? Were they you say they came out dead? Where it was they were tired. They weren't motivated. What, what's what, how do they how do they not come out strong in the in the Western Conference semifinals second half with a one goal lead? That's the question nobody can answer. Yeah, there's a million theories. I I think the one I've settled on is that I think to me it seemed like the team was pressing that nobody seemed to be on the same page, and the more passes that were hit too heavy for one of our wingers to run onto, the more that we weren't getting the 50, 50 balls, it seemed to kind of compound on itself and just seemed to get worse. That no matter how much we tried to claw and dig our way out, it just seemed to get worse and worse. So yeah, let's yeah. start, let's start with the finger pointing. We're, we're talking in broad strokes here, but who, who, who can we, is it, is it players? Was it preparation or, or, you know, we can talk about giving some blame here to Vermees without it being a fire Vermees discussion. <laughs> uh, yeah, let's just, we should just start off the pod by saying that we are, this is not, there's no one on this show that is going to get on board with, with hashtag fire Vermees. We are not even remotely close to that. And, uh, and we're, we're, we think you're kind of a loon, a bit of a loon, if you should suggest something like that at this moment. That being said, is there some fair criticism that goes to Peter Vermees for this game? Starting yes. Polito, lack yes. of – okay, where, where where, are you at? Where's the fault in Vermees? I don't know that there's, like, one area, but I would have not started Polito. I said that last time. I think that was a mistake. I do he too. wasn't in form. He hasn't been playing. And, yes, he might look absolutely fantastic in practice because he did the f- couple times we got to see him but that's still not the same as a game. I would have kept Shelton in there and you could have brought him in towards the end. If you thought you needed a goal or going to PKs or whatever. Uh, So that's one thing I would have definitely done differently. I'm not sure what their actual game plan was for this one. The previous game, I'm very confident that they were laying off the back line, letting them come out because they weren't used to it. It felt like they were doing that for a while. And then I wasn't, and then they started to press and then, the press was getting beat and then they were just chaos after that. So I'm not sure what the game plan actually was, 
but I don't, I, and maybe they, maybe they were, were confused also for some reason, which wouldn't seem right. I mean, you think you would be pretty confident for me to say, this is what we're going to do today, boys. Yeah. We, you know, that was the main topic last week was how clear and sneaky of a strategy that was and how well it clearly worked. So Robert, what, did, what was the game plan in this one? Did you, did you see one? Well, it's a little difficult to see. However, I am going to debate a little bit though, or disagree a little bit that, uh, and I'm looking at my notes. I just rewatched the second before we came on here. And from the 45th to the 60th minute, we were well organized. We uh, had a number of interceptions, but what to me was missing was we were not being aggressive enough going forward. We passed up some passes that were open to forward players. We played negatively instead. As David mentioned, we had a few passes that were off the mark, but things were actually, I thought, pretty good for the first 11 minutes. And then, of course, you know what happened shortly after that, Miriam and Julio came on and that completely changed the game. And then we didn't adjust to that. And I think that's a big issue that Vermees did not cover. Okay, what are they doing? Why are they bringing in those guys? What's their purpose? How can we counter that? I don't think he countered it well. Yeah, your dog is not happy with Vermees either. Yeah, I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> David, was there a game plan? Oh, I'm sure there was a game plan. I don't what know. Was what was it? Oh, <laughs> I mean, I don't. I could drink the rest of this bottle of liquor and not figure it out. But I think the big difference between RSL and Vancouver tactically is that you know Vancouver plays three at the back, and so when they're in the attack, when you invite them into the attack, they'll push their wing backs forward. So they really truly only have three at the back. And that opened up space for us to hit those diagonal switches and get our wingers into space. RSL doesn't play three at the back. We're playing four at the back and Herrera and Brody don't really aren't known for getting forward. Um, and then when you look at kind of the heat map of where they ended up on the field, you know, they played, you know, along the, the, the sides, obviously, but, you know, pretty well set in the middle. They weren't, you know, getting to the byline and trying to whip balls in like, you know, Martin sometimes does or Zussi does. And notably, our fullbacks, I mean, are pretty well anchored across what you would kind of view as the back line um, when you're setting up a team on, a, on the pitch and like looking at, you know, at the start of the game. I mean, Zussi has no runs forward, none. I mean, he's firmly anchored at the back. And so he wasn't involved in the play at all. And that was what made us so dynamic against Vancouver was Zussi's ability to get involved in the attack. Uh, Martins was got for it a little bit more, uh, but they just got completely neutered by the fact that RSL was, you know, compact and pressed us and we seemingly couldn't get out of our own way. The fashion in which the goals were scored was, was really frustrating to me as well. There were, it was just two very quick, simple plays. Um, you know, the Bobby Wood one, especially just... <laughs> mainly the frustration there because of whose boot it came off of in Bobby Wood himself. But yeah, I mean, it was just that actually that goal started with, so Justin Miriam had come off the bench and took the ball in midfield and was taking on a Graham Zussi who, albeit we just mentioned was not running up the field all day, but it was a Graham Zussi in the 92nd minute and he just didn't quite have the legs and all Miriam had to do was, one very, you know, sophomoric move, juke inside and then down the sideline, and Zussi was beaten badly. And then it was just that one, just one little quick, tiny dink of the foot, and and the season is over. It was just, it, it really was just such a gut-wrenching, gut-wrenching game. I was just settling in for overtime, for extra time. And, uh, and, and actually, oh, this is that, this is the other part of that. Bobby Wood was warming up. All of them were warming up right in front of me. And I had the opportunity to scream my head off at Bobby Wood. And I didn't because I was worried of something like this happening. I say he was in my earshot. I could have, I could have been screaming at him for all of his failures in the Bundesliga and all the relegations he's been a part of, but, but no, I kept my mouth shut. I tried to be a good guy and it didn't work anyway. I should have gotten in his head. Yeah, my thought when he came on was, oh, he subbed in for Real Salt Lake the last three games and hasn't done anything. And then what does he do? <laughs> yeah, Actually, going, going back to that uh, game-winning goal, um, 
you know, I'm going to debate. I'm going to argue with you a little bit there, uh, Cody. Shallowy is chasing uh, Miram for a good 40 yards. Mm -hmm. And he had a chance to foul him, do whatever, but he gives up about the 43rd yard. I get it. It was a long run, but he never really seemed to put in a great effort to stop Miram. But Zuzi doesn't lose Miram because of his, he's tired. He loses him because Zuzi slows down like he's going to tackle Miram. Miram sees that, makes a big touch, and sprints away from him because Zuzi had changed his pace and he took advantage of it. So that was Zuzi's mistake, not that he was tired. Uh, and then, I don't know. That was some, it was some heavy legs on the, on the jump in. Yeah, well, he slowed down to do a tackle, but he didn't do the tackle. That was his fault. He should have gone in for the tackle right there, but he didn't. Miram saw it in big touch by him, and that was the end of it. But Fontas also allows his mark to get goal side. He slows down at the end, thinking the ball is going to go behind his mark for some reason, allows Wood to be near post, goal side, and to flick it on. So I think there's more blame to go around, and I don't think it was Zuzi's tired legs. I think it was his indecision. One other play one thing, that – go ahead, David. I was going to say one thing of note. In, at one point in the second half, Zuzi pulled up lame and was limping noticeably for a couple minutes. But there were plenty of opportunities to foul – Justin Miram to just hack him down, take the yellow and move on. I also, I put blame on Zussi for the first goal too, for not closing mm -hmm. out the cross. Um, and that's been one of my beefs with both him and Martins all year long is allowing too many crosses in and not closing down, you know, players on the wing enough. Another play that I think rewatching came back to bite us was Remy Voltaire had a great steal right there in the final third and took the ball and it ended up being a, like a three verse two right there in the final third. And he took it himself with a wide open Daniel Shallowy streaking in a, in a spot where he has scored about five goals from this season alone. And Remy took it himself and you could just see it in Daniel's face. You could see it on Shallowy and you could see it on Gotti Kinda, all three of them would have been a better option than, than Remy taking it. And he did. And I don't, I don't like nitpicking on one play, but I do recall that one sticking out at the time. And then, yeah, rewatching the highlights, it sticks out even more as, as just such a golden opportunity that really would have put, you know, would have made it two to nothing after the PK. And yeah, that's a very different game. Yeah. I agree with you on that one for sure. But on the RS goal equalizer, Sorry, I don't agree at all about Zuzi. Zuzi did nothing wrong. He pressured as fast as he could after the initial clear by Issy. But uh, here was the problem. Martins chooses to cover Fontas, who has a mark, instead of running with Julio. Julio, Julio, however you say it, is totally unmarked. Martins just lets him go. Zuzi pressures as fast as he can. And then Melia, he goes out in no man's land when he should have stayed rooted on his line. He totally no man's land couldn't do anything about what happened after that. So I don't blame Zuzi at all. Okay. Well, that was some good finger pointing though. <laughs> We've pointed the finger at quite a few people today already. So I'm calling that a win. But only <laughs> players. Cause I've got more Ted uncle for missing the handball. And Justin glad that even let these clowns in the playoff. Yes. There you go. Where the VAR was Kevin Stott. Uh, who else do we have? Who was the referee in this game? Was this a new referee? It is one that I, I feel like most games that I'm looking at, I can see the referee and, uh, and recognize him and know who it is. And this one, I, I couldn't quite tell. Kevin Stott, who's yeah. been a ref for a long time. Oh, wow. I don't know. Well, I guess it was just from a distance where I was already drunk. And actually, I thought he did a decent job other than he could have thrown a couple of yellows earlier to yes. clean it up a little bit. But he was... I know refs don't want to give too many yellows in playoff games and change things. I don't like that, but I don't think he, would, I don't think he did a bad job other than he could have thrown a couple of yellows earlier. And I think that on almost every ref. So. Does anyone want to take the reins on re refuting the fire Vermees crowd? <laughs> like and I, when I think about, if I hear that, it's one of those like, like 50 different rebuttals try to fly out of my mouth at the same time. <laughs> and I can't, I can't quite even put it into one succinct way to tell them why they're so wrong about it. But who does anyone want to take that? Do we need to do that? 
Are we beyond that on this show? Well, I think uh, it's a situation where you're going to get bogged down in argument for a long time and people will be throwing back ideas and thoughts and that's fine. But I think the real question comes down to this. Are you happy with three home playoff losses in a row? Is that, is that okay? We won the last playoff game. 2018, 2020, 2021, we lost all playoff games at home when we had a pretty clear shot to, you know, hosting and we had teams lose and drop off. That's yeah, but you just said, that's you just happened. said, you just said in a row, we won, we won. Meaning three game. seasons, 2018, 2020, 2021. Those so it would have been better losses at home. It would yeah. have been better if one of those playoff losses was away. You have to win playoff game home, don't you? And to do it three seasons like that, where you had it all right there in front of you and you fail all three times, is that good enough? Well, I mean, Robert, to counter your point, how often do we see teams win the double? Almost never, right? The supporter shield winner who has home field advantage throughout the duration of the playoffs almost never wins MLS Cup. Well, we didn't win a supporter shield, so <laughs> my my point is that winning playoffs is hard. At a certain point, all the teams left are good. And yeah. so went so home field is great. And and the whole point of the regular season is to put yourself in the best possible position to succeed. I would rather play at Sporting Park than play at Salt Lake or play at Colorado or play at Portland. Uh and so, but that also means that sometimes you're gonna lose home playoff games because sometimes teams are better than you are. And the, all we can ask of Vermees is to put us in the best possible position to succeed. And at a certain point, it's about the 11 guys on the field actually winning the games. As for the Fire Vermees crowd, um, I have a list of all the MLS coaches who have ever won more than one cup. <laughs> Bruce has five. Uh, MLS coach of the year today, by the way. Siggy Schmidt has two. Frank Yallop has two. Dom Kinnear has two. Schmetzer has two and Caleb Porter has two. That's it. Since the league started, that is it. It's hard to win the tournament. It's hard to win a, a knockout tournament. No matter, and, and most of these teams weren't supporter shield winning teams. They weren't the best team in the league that year. Yeah. Of, of that it gets list, harder every year. It gets of harder that list, every year. Are there any, any of them that – are there anyone on that list that you would find at least indifferent with Vermees? Because I would rather have Vermees than every single name on that list. Not, not just – I don't even think it would be an even trade-off for any of them. Yeah, I'm saying that about Bruce Arena too. Bruce, get out of here, Bruce. I'm still angry I mean, about the World Cup. Yeah, yeah, I mean, for sure on that. What, what's tough is that Bruce is the only one who is also the technical director, right? Bruce is really Vermees's only true peer mm-hmm. who controls everything top to bottom. And he's great. I mean, there's no denying how – good he's been um schmetzer's good you know i mean seattle what seattle's done since 2016 is is really impressive and i don't know that there's really any debate there but, but then even him even he was even getting a lot of questions about their loss in that yeah, last there's game. seattle but fans calling for his head in the lineup game. that he put right. out yeah right yeah I, I actually don't think schmetzer is that great i think he gets a lot more credit than than maybe is due but yes seattle has been has been good and continues to be good since he took over. Well, like, you know, Caleb Porter won MLS Cup last year with Columbus and then arguably improved their roster. They didn't have any big departures. They added hot boy Kevin Molino. And they didn't make the playoffs this year. You know, in a single elimination tournament, I mean, how often – we see this in the NCAA tournament too or even in the Super – like in the NFL. Like, how often does the best team actually win? Sometimes. Not always. Usually not. MLS is ridiculous. MLS is tough. At a certain point with salary caps, there's a ton of parity. And on any given day, somebody can be better than you. No, I'm certainly not in the Fire Vermees crowd, but it's a pattern. Losing at home, 2018. I don't. I would argue Portland wasn't the better team that year. 2020. Hold on. Hold on. Okay. Minnesota was not the better team that year. This, this is, RSL is not the better team this year. This How is come? such a weird discussion, though. So if well, we didn't make the playoffs the this year, 
if we didn't make the pass. playoffs this year, then that would be better because they don't have three no, home no, playoff no. exits. Like, I, I don't understand. This. Or if like, we'd have finished seventh and lost well, at listen. Seattle. Yeah, like, it's just such a weird thing. Like, it, it's in order to make this argument, you have to ignore what they won the West. They won the West in 2018. Like, okay, and, you're not and they were the three seed that, this year. Like, that's just that's just an you're odd. You're not listening to my argument. My argument is the pattern. Okay. A pattern, a pattern of getting home playoff games. Yeah, that's a good pattern. And then <laughs> losing those three in all three games. That's a pattern. Okay. What is the reason for it? Because only one team gets at all. I'm just saying, what is the reason for it? The reason is that they're uh, that they continue to be very good and get home playoff games, and that only one team wins the MLS Cup every year. Okay. And Robert, not to be not to be flippant. Uh, <laughs> As but, Cody you was. know, but but prior to uh, losing three at home uh, in 2017, we lost to Houston at Houston, one and done. The year before that, uh, Seattle cheated to win, uh, but we lost at Seattle in the Benny Field Harbor is a God game. Uh, the year before that was the double doink uh, in Portland. Mm. You know, so prior to losing three in a row at home, we lost three in a, uh, in a row away. Um. I mean, the pattern is that we lose playoff games, but that's the pattern for pretty much all the other teams in the league. I mean, Seattle and Toronto had many dynasty had dynasties in the last few years, but most of these teams don't win. I mean, there's 27 teams in the league. Most of, <laughs> most of them don't win playoff games. Yes, valid point. Right, there's only the... one. There's only one team that ends the season with joy. Sure, but. Three times like that. I mean, even winning, losing six playoff games, one and out, or whatever you want to, whatever, six years in a row losing like that. I mean, yeah, I just, I think you guys should debate what the issue is. Why have we lost three home playoff games in those seasons? Why has that happened? But we but also if won. Argue, if you don't want to debate it, then we won't debate it. Didn't we win? Didn't they win one also the year they lost to Portland? Didn't they win the game before that also? Yeah, but again, yeah, the point is, is we're at home. We should have better chances of winning at home and reward our fans. And it just hasn't happened the last three times. Oh, it and did. You don't it, find literally that happened. it literally did problem, happen this year. I do. <laughs> it literally did happen this year. We won one of those home playoff games. Okay, won. Okay, nice. And then we lost to a team that we shouldn't have lost to. Why? Yeah, well, that okay. That's a, why we lost that game. Why did we lose question. Minnesota last time? Why did? Why does it happen? It's a pattern. Uh, yeah, I don't. I guess. I guess you could call it a pattern if they are like winning ever. They're they're at the highest seed and then fail in the first game or something like that would be a <laughs> that would right. be a pattern. But like a team okay. that does well and consistently earns themselves home playoff games. That's not what I'm arguing, though. <laughs> well, okay, so Robert, like, let's let's talk a little bit then about kind of the our our playoff history, right? So we obviously we win the cup in 2013, and then yeah. the next few years we were limping into the playoffs and getting pummeled by the Red Bulls at Red Bulls and everything, right? And the organization said like we we changed our philosophy from being a high pressing all out attack to more possession based, right? Defend with the ball. And the organization said, we are not content with losing on the road to Seattle. We're not content losing on the road to Houston, right? So the push was then, we want home playoff games, right? So in 2018, the yeah. whole campaign, the, mar- the whole marketing campaign was, we want home playoff games. So in 2018, we earned ourselves a home playoff game. We got a buy in the first round, right? Right. We won the West. And so then we beat Salt Lake. That's two, two playoff wins, I'm calling it, because they got a buy there. Well, <laughs> well, that's convenient well, for your argument. <laughs> well, that was well, that was also when for the a team doing were, well, yeah, <laughs> that was also when the playoffs were played on a two leg aggregate. So, yeah, we threw Salt Lake yeah. one, and then we beat them four to two. And then we got to the next round. We played Portland. The first game's away, and we drew nil nil at Portland. So the away goal rule comes into effect, and I think that's a different beast to analyze when we're talking about our playoff exit because once away goals come into effect it changes the entire dynamic of how the second leg plays. Oh, well, of course it does. And so, you know, we went up early in that game. Then Blanco hit just an absolute banger to, to draw it. Now we're chasing the game, even though it's one, one on aggregate, they've got the away goal. And so it forced us to open up and fight 
more. They score a second. We score a second, but we're still chasing because they've got the away goals. And so that whole thing is kind of, that's a different beast, right? Is the strategy of playing for a draw on the road to start the a two leg series. 2019 were terrible. 2020, I mean, I don't know. Minnesota was really good. <laughs> but Renux was really good. I don't know what else there's to say about it. He might be, you know, the best 10 in the league, you know, or second best. He's up there with Carlos, Carl Seal and, and uh, uh, Lucas El Rayon. I mean, there are certain guys in the league who are dynamic, game breaking players. And MLS playoffs always show those when you have a guy like that, you can do damage. Kevin Molino and, and Reynoso just went nuclear on us. I don't know. I mean, I don't know that what else there is to explain about it. And I would just like to add on for the for last year against Minnesota, they were missing Polito, they were missing Kenda, and sure. it was in a mostly empty stadium. So there wasn't a lot of home field advantage. Yeah. So that was a factor in it. I'm not again, I'm not trying to totally defend everything here, but your two of your best attacking players and not much of a home field advantage probably played a role in that also. But again, I don't, I think they came out to not play. I don't think they played well in that game at all. That game against Minnesota last year. So if you're looking for a pattern, I think the pattern isn't that they've lost three times at home in a row in the last win in their last loss of the year. It's that there's been a bit of uneven play is where one game they can be dominant. Yeah. One game they can, do everything right to the game plan. And then one game they can play well for portions of it, but not for enough of it in order to win, to get the win. I think that might be the pattern that we're trying to suss out below the, below the, the rhetoric. This episode is brought to you by Reese's peanut butter cups. Some things are just better together, like party playlists and Friday nights, campfires and ghost stories peanut butter, and chocolate. And Reese's Cups are the perfect combination of creamy peanut butter and delicious milk chocolate. So, when you want something sweet, you can't do better than Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. Buy Reese's today wherever candy is sold. Okay, should we move on to looking ahead? Can we wrap can we wrap up the sorrow for this this last game and we can talk about the <laughs> the the incoming roster moves that, are, that should be happening here in, a, in the next day or two. Let's do it. Yes. Okay. There are 12 questions to be answered when it comes to roster decisions. Is that right? There are 12 players that a decision needs to be made. Yes, sir. Yes, do you sir. Have those pulled up Robert. No, I'm working on it though. <laughs> Preparation, guys. Look at that. We're so good at this. Graham Zusi, Roger Espinoza, Daniel Shallowy, Graham Smith, Kendall McIntosh, Ilya, Jalen, Martins, Felipe, Punchech, and Dia. And some of them are out of contract with no option here. Some of them have a 2022 option that can be picked up. What are the big headline ones that stand out to you? What's a move that needs to be made? Zusi was the first one. Is Zusi back? I, would I think. Good. Okay, Robert decided he didn't have something there. Uh, no, oh. yeah. After after he scores that screamer, uh, I think. He, oh, I thought. I was... <laughs> uh, oh, oh, okay. Uh, I guess we're. I guess Robert, we're losing. We're losing it a little bit. <laughs> it's okay. Did Robert? Did Robert move into my house? Does he have the bad one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you guys Maybe traded I too much. Pull it up here. <laughs> uh, okay, what I was going to say is that uh, I think if you're looking at Roger and Zuzi, both the elders, I think uh, Zuzi would be the one that I would keep above Roger just because I think Zuzi has more to offer. Is this the end of Roger? Did Roger play his last game for Sporting KC? Oh. He might have. Was that a moment of silence? <laughs> I'm, I'll pour one out for Roger. Yeah, I mean, I'm not ready for that yet. I mean, I think more than more than the roster spot itself is the value of the contract and the roster flexibility that we would get. So, Roger makes five hundred thousand dollars a year, and Zusi makes seven hundred and is well six fifty base, but he makes over seven hundred thousand in guaranteed comp. So, 
it's it's maybe not a question of should we keep Roger. I think Roger as a super sub late in games has value, um, but not at five hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, I, I think would that's like agreed. to keep him at a lower amount myself. I mean, I, I'm sure he doesn't want that, but so what well, do you make of the thought that nothing's been said about either of these guys as far as anything really goes contract wise? Is it Roger doesn't want all the emphasis on him? Oh, it's Roger's last season. Or do you think there's negotiations going on and that's why nothing's been said in any way, anywhere about it? They don't normally like talk about things it's, like that, do they? It has been asked. And basically Vermees has said that this is not the time to talk about it. It's so I more take it that it's, they just want to get through the end of the season. I th- it, there seems to be like two times they really do this. Like there's like a middle part of the season that all of a sudden they'll like announce stuff that out of the blue. Yes, we did extensions, but most often it is in the off season. Who else? Anybody want to see kick to the curb? That's a little mean way to say it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, Kendall McIntosh makes just, short of a hundred thousand dollars a year i would i'd be willing to cut him you know he never he didn't play as a backup right whenever Melia was out for body slamming christian rolled on right. uh, or at the beginning of the year when he was hurt right we played pools camp who's cheaper and better um so again it's maybe not a matter of like is he good or bad should he be back because he's good or bad but for the hundred thousand dollars, could we use that money better elsewhere? Well, it's also been a rotating thing each year as they bring in a veteran just to be there to fill that role in case Tim gets hurt. But Pulse Camp is developed out of the out of the academy. He came from elsewhere, but he played in. Uh, we got his homegrown right, so he didn't develop through the academy. I, I said that wrong, but he developed out of Swope Park, SKC two, and he's a very good keeper. He's been rated in the top, however many of you under 23 keepers in the, in the United States, but so is Brooks Thompson. The other one that the other of the four keepers on sporting roster. So McIntosh is a good guy. He's not a bad keeper, but that rotating thing where we've had Alec Khan and all these other guys who just like rotate through it for a year or two and then they go away. I think he's just another one that's going to happen because we got two other guys who can at least fill that role if Thompson is healthy. Honestly, it just doesn't feel right talking about roster moves yet. <laughs> I thought I thought if we talk, make... I thought if we talked about it long enough in this pod, I would get all of my grief out, but I'm just not ready to do it yet. Can I still be sad? You can still be sad. I mean, they're going to make the decision tomorrow whether you're sad or not. <laughs> I could, I could never, I could never work in sports. I could never do what Peter Vermees does. I have too much of a softy. You know, I, I would like to get out one moment of angst and anger, and it, this is for nobody else but me. Okay, so being the photographer, I go different routes than everybody else does in the stadium for reporters and stuff. So coming from the field to go to the the interview room afterwards i have to go by the visiting locker room and rsl staffers celebrating their asses off while i'm walking to the interview room to get there thanks after the interview i stand around and talk to chad for a while i talk to a couple players i talk to a couple of sporting staffers because i really don't want to go back that way i want them to be gone but i still even though i waited for a while by the time i get going back through that way there's RSL staffers out there drinking beer in the hallway, eating freaking Jack Stack. And I'm like, I, I just like, I don't want to go through these guys, but that was the path I had to go through to leave. Mm. It just I sucked. feel for I you on that one. That, man. It's, it's their first time. Well, first time in almost a decade. So. Yeah. <laughs> so that just kind of sucked. I was looking for you. Were you, I, I was in the, on the cauldron end. Were you on the cauldron end at all? In the second half. Hmm. I was in a certain state in the second half, so. I have a great shot of Ochoa celebrating. Oh, okay. Can we can we for a moment talk about how terrible of a person he is? That he probably <laughs> apple pie and America and like <laughs> his grandmother and like just the worst human being I've and, ever seen on a soccer field. And such a punchable face. 
<laughs> I mean, Luis Suarez bit a guy twice and is still not as bad as David Ochoa. Anything to shake